singular focus, finding and developing new drugs for Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. We're the only nonprofit with that sole mission. One groundbreaking vision, advancement through venture philanthropy, pursuing investments, not grants, in the most innovative and promising science and treatments, helping commercialize them, and reinvesting the proceeds. We were among the first to leverage this model. One incredible commitment. 100% of all donations support our science, thanks to the generosity of our co-founders, Leonard and Ronald Lauder, and the whole Lauder family. We are the ADDF, the Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation. It's been a momentous year in Alzheimer's research. We're witnessing incredible progress with more potential breakthroughs right around the corner. Much of this progress can be traced to the ADDF. So how did we arrive at this moment and what are we doing to seize it? ADDF founding executive director and chief science officer, Dr. Howard Phillip explains. Neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's really have just one cause. So from the beginning, our research strategy anticipated multiple causes of Alzheimer's. The early generations of Alzheimer's drug research understandably focused on the first known hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease, the beta amyloid plaques in the brain. We believe that combination therapies are the ultimate answer for managing and treating Alzheimer's disease. So how are we getting there? Here are three key areas of research. First, we're surveying the field and identifying the causes of Alzheimer's disease based on the biology of aging, the leading risk factor. These include brain inflammation, vascular problems, and genetic causes, among others. Second, we're developing therapies targeting these causes. Some of these therapies have advanced into later stage clinical trials. And over time, the ADDF's own drug development pipeline has not only become one of the largest, but also one of the most diverse. And the rest of the industry has followed suit. More than half of the approximately 120 drugs currently in clinical trials focus on a wide range of targets. We've also led the way in championing repurposed drugs. Treatments already approved for other illnesses are being tested. Repurposed drugs hold promise for Alzheimer's disease and a potential faster route to approval. Another key component of our strategy focuses on the prevention of Alzheimer's. You'll learn more about the exciting work we're supporting later in this program. And third and finally, we're helping to create innovative diagnostic tools and biomarkers that you may have heard about. They help scientists enroll the right patients for the clinical trials and track the progress and efficacy of new drugs to ensure that trials are more focused, rigorous, and accurate than ever before. Particularly interesting and important is the arrival of the first blood test for Alzheimer's disease, which ADDF invested in. Furthermore, the Diagnostics Accelerator was founded by ADDF, driving us towards game-changing technologies for scientists and patients alike. So far, the Diagnostics Accelerator has funded over 30 projects with almost $40 million in investments. These are even more innovative tools. New blood tests, eye tests, and digital health tests. Imagine a day of less invasive, far more affordable, and accessible ways to diagnose Alzheimer's disease reliably and earlier than ever, and to accelerate and enhance the development of new clinical trials. We believe that there will be new drugs on the market to prevent and treat Alzheimer's disease and related dementias in the near future. ADDF is creating that future. This is what we started out to do, and we're accomplishing it. We are in this all together, and being all together, I promise you, we'll find a cure. Welcome to the 12th annual fall event of the Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation. I am Mark Roy Mir and I have the privilege, honor, and pleasure of being the CEO of the ADDF. At the ADDF, we're about three things. One, funding innovative science. Two, have a responsibility to bring that science to market through treatments that can affect the lives of patients and their families. And three, we're about return on those investments that we then take and put 
back into the science. That's all brought to you by the Lauders. Their vision created this. Their vision carries us forward. In just a little while, you'll enjoy a fabulous symposium focused on prevention today with two of our leading scientists, Goods Prize winner, Dr. Mia Kebapelto and Dr. Miranda Orr. And we greatly look forward to the annual presentation of the Charles Evans Award this year to Howard and Mitchell Caniff. We hope you will consider donating by scanning the QR code on your screen right now. And remember, thanks to the generosity of the Lauder family, 100% of your donation goes directly to the science. And now for the presentation of the Melvin R. Goods Prize to Dr. Mia Kevapelto. It was important to me to honor my husband's legacy. In 2015, we worked with ADDF to launch what is formally known as the Melvin R. Goods Prize. The impetus was the reality that outstanding, groundbreaking scientists almost always go unheralded. Our goal is to help fund the bridge between research and a potential drug ready for testing in the clinic. The award is named for Mel Goods, who is a legend in the pharmaceutical industry for not only bringing Lipitor to market, but also for bringing the first drug approved by the FDA for Alzheimer's disease, a drug called Tacrin. In 2009, Mel was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. He came home from a golf game one day and was very upset because he was accused of cheating. He couldn't remember his golf score. And I said, it's time to go public. There's nothing to be ashamed of. And with Mel being public, maybe it would bring others out of the shadows. Through mutual friends that had a connection at Rockefeller University, we were told the go-to guy was Dr. Howard Phillip. Well, one week after that conversation, Howard was sitting in our living room. And one week after that, Leonard Lauder came calling. We were all in from that moment on. Mel was asked to speak at the ADDF annual luncheon. It was so brave of him, and I couldn't have been prouder. I don't expect biomedical science to ride to my rescue. But I will go out a happy man if we can change the course of this disease for the hundreds of millions of people who will soon be at risk. All of us in this room can help to make this happen. Let's keep the hope alive with our generosity, our passion, and our spirit. Thank you very much. Mel was never a quitter, and to this day, he's still fighting. He's been on two off-label drugs. One of them is in uh, clinical trials right now, supported by ADDF, and cognitively, for almost 12 years, Mel is doing amazing, really amazing. His mindset is what I really look up to and I think my whole family does too, is just the ability to take every negative situation and make it something positive. I think that with ADDF and the Goods Prize, it's only bringing us closer to finding a cure or at least slowing down the process of this horrible disease. This is our seventh year and the six preceding Goods Prize winners have all been uh, internationally recognized for their contributions to both preclinical and clinical research in developing drugs for Alzheimer's disease. We're very proud to, to honor Mia Kivapelto, who is the awardee this year. Mia is a geriatrician like myself. She created a study called the Finger Study which is being replicated all over the world as a model for showing that prevention can really work. Finger study was the first randomized controlled trial to show that it is possible to prevent cognitive and functional decline among at-risk elderly persons. And what we did in the finger trial was the multi-domain intervention. It was physical activity, healthy diet, cognitive training, uh, uh, social activity and taking care of all vascular metabolic risk factors like high blood pressure, cholesterol, obesity and diabetes. And when taking into account all these factors, we were able to really reduce the risk of cognitive decline, functional decline, there was better health-related quality of life and even 60% reduced risk of other disease. We're very proud at ADTF to be funding the second generation 
of her prevention trial. We are combining finger model with the possible disease modifying drug, metformin, that is used for diabetes, and that is a repurposed uh, drug design, and it fits very well for the finger model where we are also targeting metabolic and vascular risk factors. So it's clearly taking the next step, the next generation of clinical trials, and I'm really grateful uh, for the support from ADDF to make this happen. Congratulations, Dr. Kivapalto. Your studies and research are only bringing us closer to finding a cure for Alzheimer's and to eliminate losing time with our loved ones. The Goodest Prize is a great honor for me and for my whole team. And thinking Mel, known as a prominent leader in pharma industry, he was able to make a difference and his work has had a huge impact on so many persons' lives. And having the prize with his name and seeing now the dedicated work and general support Nancy and the family are putting on Alzheimer's research is really a source of inspiration. Thank you so much. Hi everyone, I'm Paula Zahn and I'm very honored to be with you virtually today. I've had the pleasure of hosting the ADDF's annual fall symposium and luncheon since its inception. And as always, it's such a special opportunity to celebrate groundbreaking science with you. Recently, I sat down with my dear friend and ADDF co-founder, Leonard Lauder, to discuss his initial vision for the ADDF, the progress we've seen thus far, and what lies ahead for Alzheimer's research. Since you and Ronald founded the ADDF, it's, it's quite astonishing. People said, this disease can't be, it can't be cured or it can't be licked because they, all the drug trials fail. Why did they really fail? They failed because too many people who didn't have Alzheimer's were being put in the trial. And why was that? There was no definitive scientific way of saying, you have Alzheimer's. ADDF was the leader in getting the first amyloid PET scan created. It's called Amavid, which we did in 2012. That became the first scientific test. And then years later, we came up with the blood test. So now we have two definitive ways of saying, do we have Alzheimer's? And ADDF understood very early on how critical this early diagnosis of Alzheimer's was not only to the patients and their caregivers, but the scientists on the ground conducting the clinical trials. But let's talk about the next generation, all of this, Leonard. The ADDF has developed the Young Professionals Committee, and many members of that committee either have parents or board members or other family members on the board. And, and one of those members is someone very near and dear to you, your grandson, Josh. Josh is one of the founders of this, uh, of the group. And he saw the passion that I had for it and all, the, all of our colleagues in ADDF. And he said, I think that's something I can really help. And help he has. We are all so appreciative of your family's continued dedication to this cause. I send you my thanks. And I wish I could reach out and hug you right now, Paula, because you've done great things, not only for Alzheimer's, but for the nation and for the world. We all thank you my love back to you and and again congratulations on uh, yet another very important milestone in the history of ADDF. Thank you Paula. Bye. For those of you who haven't contributed to the event yet we hope you will consider donating by scanning the QR code on your screen and remember 100% of your donation goes directly towards science. Thank you all for your very generous donations. Now it's my great honor and privilege to introduce ADDF co-founder, Ronald Lauder. In just the last several years, we are seeing new developments and breakthroughs in biomarkers, drug development, and prevention. As we prepare to enjoy our fall symposium, here first is Ronald on the importance of prevention in tackling this disease. 23 years ago, in some ways it seems like just yesterday, but I want to remind you, in 1998, there was no hope 
for anyone diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. Zero. It was a death sentence. In fact, it was worse. It was a long, difficult, and heartbreaking death sentence. We wanted to change that. Today, 23 years later, because of the great work that ADDF has accomplished, there is now hope. Perhaps the most important change we've seen since 1998 is in prevention. In today's symposium, you will learn more about our research in prevention. You will meet two outstanding scientists, Dr. Mia Kiva-Pelto and Dr. Randor, who came up with these brilliant ideas. The ADDF is providing them with the financial support to push these ideas through clinical trials. This is how we will beat this disease. And it's up to all of you who have been such a critical link in helping us gain the eventual victory. You are providing these brilliant scientists with the tools, the financial support, they needed to, to finish the job together. We will win this battle and eliminate so much suffering. This is an incredible change since 1998. And it came from innovation, risk-taking, new ideas, and especially your support. I thank all of you from the bottom of my heart. It is now my great honor to introduce the founding executive director and chief scientist officer of ADDF, the man Leonard and I first hired when we created ADDF, and the man who is still doing a great job, leading a remarkable foundation all these years later, Dr. Howard Phillips who will lead our panel discussion. Howard. Thank you, Ronald. Thank you so much. And, and thank you for your inspiration and your leadership over the years, and most recently, and uh, asking us to focus even more on prevention than we have in the past. I hope these two speakers today will give you, give everyone some idea of just what we're doing in the field of advancing and accelerating prevention. I also want to thank Nancy Goods and, and the Goods family for uh, the award today and congratulate Mia for uh, being the recipient of that award. Uh, Mia is a longtime colleague. I wanna say that three of us on the panel today are all geriatricians. I know most of you are used to dealing with neurologists in the field, but I think you're gonna see today how geriatricians and specialists in the aging process mm -hmm can lead the field forward, particularly because aging is the leading risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. And what you're seeing today is an execution of that strategy uh, through Mia's clinical work and Dr. Orr's clinical trials uh, in prevention and treatment based on the biology of aging, which is our scientific strategy going beyond amyloid and tau into the many other mechanisms that you heard about a little earlier today. Uh, you, you've already uh, been introduced to Mia, uh, so I won't say much. Um, she is a professor in clinical geriatrics at the Karolinska Institute, where the Nobel Prize is given. So I hope someday <laughs> that'll be an inroad to the Nobel Prize for Mia, because her studies that started out of Finland are now literally being done worldwide in almost every major developed country in the world. And what we're doing with Mia today is to kind of get into prevention 2.0, where we're, uh, as Mia is going to tell you, um, where we're going to be combining all these lifestyle and uh, comorbidity management with a drug, much like uh, when we try to prevent heart disease, we include lifestyle and comorbidity, diabetes and hypertension management, but we add statins. And in this case, uh, Mia is adding metformin. So with uh, that very brief introduction, I'm very honored to introduce Mia, who's also joined us on the Board of Governors uh, to lead us into this really interesting symposium, which is groundbreaking, in my opinion. Thank you so much. And once again, I'm extremely happy and grateful for this wonderful prize. And it's also great recognition for the prevention work. I would say that prevention is now the treatment in the Alzheimer's field. And there is so much we can do already today for the better brain health. Actually, the most recent estimates are indicating that 40% of dementia is related to modifiable risk factors. I think 40% is a big number. So there is a clear prevention potential. There are many targets and there are many timelines for the interventions. And as we heard, there has been a lot of focus on vascular and metabolic risk factors like high blood pressure and diabetes. 
But there are also some more novel risk factors like hearing loss. We know that hearing loss is common and luckily there is something we can do with the hearing aid. Also, stress and sleeping disturbances are some of these more novel risk factors. I see this quite a lot at our memory clinic. Even younger patients have these risk factors. And we have interesting new studies linking these factors with Alzheimer's pathology. So clearly, we need to have this more holistic approach when we are thinking prevention. Second important thing from our research is the time. I normally say it's never too early to start to prevent dementia. At the same time, it's never too late. We can always do something for the better brain health. And this is something we could show in the mind AD trial when we adopted the finger intervention for patients who had early Alzheimer's with very positive experiences. It has been more difficult to verify the effect of the vascular and lifestyle factors in clinical trials. A lot of the previous evidence comes from epidemiological and experimental studies. And clinical trials is the highest level of evidence. And that's also why ADDF is putting so much focus on clinical trials. As you heard, I am leading the FINGER trial, and that was the first trial to really show that it is possible to prevent cognitive decline. And we did not only focus on one of those risk factors, but we focused all of those, all these five fingers. And I think that multi-domain approach, targeting several risk factors and mechanisms at the same time, is what we need to really optimally prevent demands and AD, giving this complex etiology. So the practical recommendation is try to activate all these five fingers every day as much as possible. And what we could see was really the clear benefit on memory, cognition, functional decline, and even quality of life, life was better, and there was reduced risk of other chronic diseases. Interestingly, APOE4 carriers, APOE4 is the most important genetic risk factor. APOE4 carriers got the clear benefit of the intervention. So it is possible to counteract the genetic risk with the lifestyle intervention. Uh, we started the Worldwide Fingers Network 2017 to support different countries to adopt and optimize the finger model in different populations and settings. And I'm very happy that today we are having more than 40 countries from all continents who are uh, here, a part of the Worldwide Fingers Network. So it's really the first truly global network for multi-domain dementia prevention trials. And I'm sure we will learn a lot from this network. Finally, as part of the Worldwide Fingers Network, I'm leading the MET finger trial, using for the first time an updated finger 2.0 approach, where we are combining more personalized uh, finger-based intervention with the possible disease-modifying drug, metformin, that is a diabetes medication. And I'm very grateful for the support from ADDF for this Nobel trial. So clearly, it's exciting times in the research, and we are so dedicated to move on to develop the next generation of clinical trials and translate the results for, for the clinical practice. Thank you so much. We can't hear you, Howard. Thank you, Mia. Thank, thank you so much for your talk and your work. Um, I just wanted to mention to the audience, there's about 150 people on, that if you have questions, please submit them through the Q&A uh, box on your screen. And uh, once we, after we hear from Miranda Orr, uh, we'll be opening up the, uh, the program to questions. So please keep your questions in mind and please feel free to enter them into the Q&A box at any time. Uh, it's my privilege and honor to now introduce uh, Miranda Orr, who uh, I hope we'll all, there she is. Uh, Miranda is also a geriatrician, uh, an assistant professor of gerontology, the study of aging, and a professor, an assistant professor of geriatric medicine at Wake Forest uh, School of Medicine. 
And she's uh, actually, as I mentioned earlier, actually translating the biology of aging into new therapeutics for Alzheimer's disease. This is really exciting. It's, it's building on the emerging field of geroscience and how cells age and how actually age itself can actually be a detriment to uh, multiple, multiple organs, including an Alzheimer's disease. And so her clinical trial is really innovative and really at the forefront of translating the biology of aging into new drugs. And the trial, she's gonna tell, Miranda's gonna tell us about her, her study right now. So without any further uh, intervention uh, time, I'm gonna just turn it right over to you, Miranda. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that introduction, Dr. Fillet. It's a pleasure to be here. And I just wanna say congratulations to Mia on her award, so well-deserved. And we're all looking forward to the results from your exciting study. So as Dr. Phillip mentioned, my research focuses on the intersection between healthy aging and Alzheimer's disease. And as you've heard now many times, advanced age is the greatest risk factor for developing Alzheimer's disease. And we are trying to better understand this process. And what research has shown in animal models is that targeting these aging processes can actually modify brain aging and slow down the likelihood or reduce the negative impacts of brain diseases. So with the support of ADDF, we are beginning a clinical trial where we are targeting a fundamental aging process. So essentially, we are looking to address a central problem that may be initiating Alzheimer's disease. And what we have found, and others in the field have also found, is that in brains of people with Alzheimer's disease, there is an increase in the number of a very unique type of unhealthy cells that accumulate in all tissues throughout the body with age. And these are called senescent cells. And the presence of these cells correspond with disease and dysfunction. So our idea of this trial is to clear these unhealthy damaged cells. And this is somewhat similar to how the cancer field has used chemotherapies and radiation to kill cancer cells. So the cells we're looking at aren't cancer, so they don't divide. They don't make more of themselves, but they are like cancer in that they are very good at surviving. They're unhealthy and they make the cells and tissues around them very sick. So our strategy is to clear these cells and stop this unhealthy chronic cascade of tissue damage. Since I've made the cancer analogy, it may not come as a surprise that one of the drugs that we're using to accomplish our goal is a repurposed chemotherapy. It was developed to treat leukemia. However, we're using this drug very differently in a couple of important aspects. One is that we're using a much lower dose, so we anticipate far fewer side effects. And secondly, we're using this drug intermittently. And this is because the way this drug strategy works is we clear out the bad cells, which are a source of the problem. So once these cells are gone, in theory, the patient wouldn't need to be treated again until more of these cells came back. So with the support of ADDF, we are beginning to test this in older adults with early Alzheimer's disease. This will be a multi-site trial involving Wake Forest and collaborators at UT Health in San Antonio and the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. So overall, our study is one year long, um, but the study participants will only receive 12 doses of the drug spanning a three-month period. So within that three-month period, they'll receive the drug for two days, and then they have a two-week break, and then repeat this six times. After completing that treatment phase, they will remain enrolled in the trial for follow-up visits, and the point of this is to collect data on how long it takes for these senescent cells to return. And this will be really important for future trials to refine the treatment strategy. So a primary goal of our study is to establish safety of this innovative treatment strategy that has not yet been tested in Alzheimer's disease. We'll also be collecting data to, to determine whether or not we are effectively clearing these cells from the body. We'll be assessing brain function and testing memory, using brain imaging um, to see if we have stopped disease from progressing. We'll also look at other markers of aging to see if the strategy alters other metrics of health. So oftentimes patients with Alzheimer's disease have other health problems in addition to poor memory. So one exciting potential our strategy is testing is the possibility of improving health of all tissues. And that would improve the overall quality of life of patients with Alzheimer's disease, which really is our ultimate goal. So we're very grateful to the ADDF for supporting our trial and I look forward to the panel discussion. Thank you so much, Miranda. That's really, it's really a fascinating study. Um, the patient population you're studying, I think, is in mild cognitive impairment. Is that correct? And could you tell us a little bit about, you know, why you picked that population? And could that be considered prevention in the sense that if you prevent people with MCI to move on to dementia, that that would be a very important kind of phase of prevention uh, in, in clinical practice? 
Yeah, absolutely. So we are recruiting both individuals with amnestic MCI as well as early Alzheimer's disease. And we think that it is really important to, to target people as early on in the disease as possible to prevent them from progressing to Alzheimer's disease, where some of the loss in function you know, is going to be really challenging to get back. But if we can prevent them from losing those key aspects of memory and brain function, that really is the goal. Okay, thank you. And um, Mia, you, um, you, you mentioned uh, about metformin. Could you, I, I frequently get asked like, how does metformin work in the brain? I mean, what, why does metformin, you know, why, why did we pick metformin besides, uh, let's say it's effect on diabetes. There's so many other mechanisms. Metformin is kind of out there as the leading anti-aging drug. Why is that? What's sort of the simple explanation of the biology there or the pharmacology? I think the exciting thing with metformin is that there are many possible mechanisms. And again, that fits so nicely with the multi-domain approach, targeting several mechanisms at the same time. Of course, the diabetes, insulin, glucose, metabolism link, and dementia is one that has been quite well established. But there are also others. The more anti-aging part, what was discussed earlier, could be there. There are nice studies also linking it more directly with Alzheimer pathology like Peter Amulet and Tau, even the synaptic uh, uh, function or dysfunction and, and neuronal loss. So I would say that there are multiple different mechanisms that are there. So that makes it very perfect drug to combine to the finger model. Or again, it's a repurposed drug approach. It's widely available and it's safe. So that was that's why it was the, the choice. We will study all the mechanisms in detail. So that's what we hope that we will learn more about the exact mechanisms in this case. Um, could I ask you, Mia, in your clinical practice, if someone came to you and they'd said, you know, I want to do anything I can possible to slow this down. Let's say they have the earliest stages of the clinical disease, mild cognitive impairment. Um, would you prescribe metformin for your patients? What we do normally is that we try to screen for all the vascular metabolic risk factors, as I mentioned, that I think that's very important also at the memory clinic, not only focus on the brain-specific measures. And if there are early indications, so then we should be quite quick to follow it up. We always start with lifestyle interventions, but in many cases, you may need something to add on. And metformin is absolutely the, the good drug to start when, when needed. And I have had many patients with positive results. When you say positive results, do you mean like you can actually see an improvement in cognition or are you measuring somehow the slowing in the rate of decline, which I know is very hard to measure? Yeah, that, that, that's a hard to measure, but it can be both, I would say, the stable function, because normally in early AD, you have a tendency to, to decline, of course. So it's more to be being stable, the functional level. That's what many patients and elderly persons are very keen on, that they can keep the functional level as good as possible. And also the well-being, people feel that they are doing better with, with that drug. That's, I think, quite exciting. We want to have a drug with not too many side effects. Right. Miranda, your, your trial is actually using a combination of drugs, desatinib and quercetin. Um, could you talk about why you chose that combination and what quercetin and desatinib do individually to you know, sort of explain the pharmacology to us? Yeah, absolutely. So these drugs were determined through a screen in cells. So using a cell model, um, inducing these cells to become senescent, and then testing drugs that could be targeting the pathways that allow these senescent cells to survive. There was a screen do done, and what was found is that the combination of desatinib along with quercetin more effectively cleared different types of senescent cells while keeping non-senescent cells alive. So that's really important because we don't want to just go and clear all sorts of healthy cells. We want to really target these senescent cells. So desatinib alone can clear some senescent cells. Quercetin alone can clear some senescent cells, but together they are more effective. Thank you. Um, one other question is uh, the senescent cells uh, cause inflammation. Um, could you speak a little bit about the role of inflammation in the disease and how you see that related to your biology of aging kind of approach to treating the disease? Yeah, so these senescent cells are a huge source of inflammation. They are very good at just releasing all sorts of toxic molecules, including inflammatory molecules. And this, of course, doesn't make their surrounding healthy cells feel very good, and then they get sick. 
and they can actually cause healthy cells to become senescent as well. And this just further perpetuates this inflammation. And as we age, these cells are accumulating, not just in our brain, but in our livers, in our adipose, in our muscle. And so they are a huge contributor to inflammation. And so if we can globally clear these senescent cells, we are attacking a major source of inflammation. At least that's what, that's what we think we will be able to achieve. Do you, do you think that uh, independently of the senescent cell clearance, that if we have to treat inflammation, that that's a, another good uh, drug target for us? I know we have several programs at the ADDF in generally trying to reduce neuroinflammation. Yeah, absolutely. And with these, the, so these drugs are called senolytics to clear senescent cells. We're already thinking about um, different strategies for combination therapies, because as you mentioned in, in the introduction, Alzheimer's disease is very complex. And, you know, we think that targeting senescent cells is one really important aspect, but we also think that combining it with other treatments, either, you know, amyloid and tau reducing therapies or metformin or anti-inflammatories, will all need to be tested in the future as well. The biomarkers are critical to drug development. Um, do we have any biomarkers now or on the horizon to identify senescent cells so we can show sort of what we call target engagement and efficacy in the clinical trials you're running? The best uh, biomarkers right now are in blood. And so there have been two other studies that have used the same drug combination in other conditions of aging. And using these blood biomarkers, there were both studies were able to, to show a reduction of these senescent cells. And so we are looking for these same markers in the cerebral spinal fluid of our study subjects, um, hoping that we will see a similar reduction. Well, thank you. I um, mean, we have a question from the audience. For people who have an ApoE4 gene, uh, should their lifestyle interventions be any different or would it be the same or intensive? What do you tell people that are ApoE4 positive? Based on the finger findings, so ApoE4 carriers are really getting a clear beneficial effect, which is very, very nice. I would say that, of course, we need to recommend healthy lifestyle for all because there are so many benefits, but especially if we know that there is Alzheimer in the families, or if we know that we have 8.4, I think we start to have enough evidence to recommend that. We have the uh, findings from experimental studies that 8.4 carriers may be more vulnerable for unhealthy lifestyle factors. And now in the finger, we could show that you can do something for that risk. We also have new findings, not yet published, that even the Alzheimer's polygenic risk score, not only APOE, it's the, exactly the same pattern. You get more clear benefit if you have the uh, higher genetic risk, which I think is optimistic. How much exactly, we don't know. So I would say, yes, if we know that there is the family history, this intervention is probably even more important. And I also think if we are moving more to the precision prevention. Maybe in the future, we can tailor both the lifestyle intervention more and maybe even some drugs that we can know, depending on your risk profile, that can be more tailored to get even better. A little bit like the cancer care is today. Right. Um, people are asking both, uh, Miranda and me, um, can, can they enroll in your trials? Uh, is it possible for them I, I don't know if the audience is mostly U.S. based, probably, but um, but how how can they enroll if they're interested in in your trials? So I'll I will start from the U.S. based trial. Um, yeah, if you are based in, near one of our study sites, definitely you can enroll. So, okay. yeah, we're in North Carolina and in San Antonio. So they should contact you at Wake Forest, or should we trans? Uh, do they want to contact me and I'll refer them to you, whichever whichever works for people out in the audience, I guess. So. Yeah. They can contact me directly. Our trial is on clinicaltrials.gov as well. Um, they can find us there or just email me directly. Yeah, so clinicaltrials.gov is a big website where all trials are listed. It's one word, clinicaltrials.gov. So, and then then they search for, for your name, I guess, Miranda, is that right? Okay, thank you. And can can we enroll in the Finnish study or do we have to move to health? Well, the, the MET finger trial will be conducted in UK, Sweden and Finland. So that's where it's now. But I hope in the future, this is the first next, genera next generation of clinical trials for the combination. So I hope that that can be then 
uh, adopted in other countries as well. We have within the worldwide fingers a uh, U.S. pointer in the U.S. and I think Wake Forest actually is the coordinating center and they are still recruiting. So for the finger model, it's still possible to join. So I would contact Laura Baker probably uh, at Wake Forest. Um, another question from the audience. They're very excited about your work. They're wondering when we we'll, might hear the results. Would it be in a year or two years or three years? So can, can you give us some expectations about our excitement of, uh, in your work? Um, yeah. So our study, each subject will be enrolled for one year, but our entire study we're anticipating to take three years. So we won't know results for a few years yet. Thank you. And, yeah. and same for me. We are starting next year or early next year. The recruitment the intervention will be two years like in finger. And that I think is the lesson. We need to have quite long intervention to really see the efficacy. So around three years from now, of course, at the same time, we will learn a lot from the worldwide fingers and finger findings to refining the evidence. But from that specific trial uh, around three years. Well, I think this emphasizes how hard it really is to do these clinical trials and how long it takes and how much money it requires to really do them well. And I want to congratulate and thank both of you for uh, doing your work and helping us to find cures and prevention treatments and lifestyles uh, for Alzheimer's disease. And I, I hope we're all around in three or four or five years to hear the results. But in the meantime, uh, we're going to do everything we can to um, prevent and treat Alzheimer's disease, maybe repurposing. I know I'm going to get asked if uh, people on the phone that uh, on the video that uh, uh, are going to be calling me to ask for metformin, and that's going to be a hard question. <laughs> but I think I agree with you, Mia. I think it's a very safe drug, and uh, it's doable, and I do prescribe off-label. So let me stop there. I want to thank you for a great panel. I want to thank the audience for listening and for your questions. And I think my next task is to turn this over to Mark, if I'm not mistaken. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Every year, we present the Charles Evans Award to honor exceptional leadership in support of Alzheimer's research. This year's award will be presented to Howard and Mitchell Kemp, dear friends of the ADDF, longtime partners of the SD Water Companies through their own family-operated business, RK Packaging, and outstanding supporters and advocates for Alzheimer's research. And first, we're honored to share the story of the Charles Evans Award's namesake, courtesy of ADDF board members and creators of the award, Bonnie Pfeiffer Evans and Alice Shore. Charles was my big brother and he lit up every room he walked into. He was really just a joyful personality. Everything he touched turned to gold. He was in many different businesses. His first huge success was Evan Picone. After that, he went into the real estate business, and then he went into the movie business. And lo and behold, the first movie he produced was Tootsie. Charles was a man of honor, very distinguished, very handsome, honest, 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 hardworking, and dedicated to the things he believed in. My father's mother had Alzheimer's. It wasn't called Alzheimer's. Nobody knew what it was. It was called senile dementia, as was my father's illness when he first showed signs of it. Charles's main focus was Alzheimer's. It was a family situation. He wanted to do something. He wanted to help desperately. Alice and I were really excited to establish the Charles Evans Award for ADDF. If my brother could only see the progress that's been made in this short period of time, he'd be over the moon because he really spent so much time and effort and money hoping to make this happen. It's really a, a great honor and a, and a privilege for me to introduce the Canna family, Howard and Mitchell, as the winners this year of the Charles Evans Prize. The Canna's are like the perfect recipients of the Charles Evans Award. They've been a vendor and a supplier of the Estee Lauder Corporation. Three generations of running RK Packaging They've been around 100 years, the company. 
The Canifs also know firsthand too well the effects of Alzheimer's. So modern day photo album, I put together some pictures of mom. And look at that smile on her face. It's just absolutely gorgeous. Beautiful woman. Where was that taken? In the early stages of our marriage. She was 25 or 26 look, years old. Looks like the Hamptons somewhere. Else. This is my wife boxing. It's a great picture because it really describes who she was as a person. She was a fighter. My first date with Sherry, when I took her out, I took her dancing. She was a strong lady, and she was absolutely enthralled with the fact that she met somebody who could dance as well. On the third date, I said to my friend, that's the lady I'm gonna marry. She had an infectious laugh, had a beautiful smile, very gracious, and she was both interesting and interested. As a great ballroom dancer, everything just flowed so effortlessly. The thing that really stands out about my mom is she was always learning something new. She studied graphology. She took Russian classes before a trip to Russia. She got a degree in interior design. She was a great athlete. She was a lovely woman, loved her. We skied together. We were friends, friends, friends. My grandma always looked her best. She always had great style. She knew what looked good in homes. As a team, my mom and dad together were unstoppable. Whether it was traveling together, all sorts of kind of exciting trips. I've been a pilot all my life. She flew all over the United States, Canada, and the Caribbean with me. And that was a very exciting part of my life. My mom was always very, very sharp, and you couldn't pass anything past her. She actually said it, which was what was kind of crazy. She said, I'm losing my mind. And at first, I really didn't, you know, I thought, you know, we just kind of use that expression, I'm, I'm losing my mind. But she really sensed that she wasn't the same person. And that was uh, scary and also a bit of denial for the family, for friends. She went to some brain doctors to take a look and they thought she might have um, water on the brain. But because of my dad's love for her, he said, that's not an answer, we have to keep looking. It's kind of amusing now in, in that sense that the doctors were so backward in terms of knowledge about the mind. But when you don't know anything, you make suppositions. And uh, uh, that's what I live with, suppositions. Because we were such dear friends, I was able to introduce them to Dr. Howard Phillip, who is the founding director and nothing less than a great genius. And that's how the process started, how we were introduced uh, to the doctor as well as how we were introduced to Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation. I was able to help in, in terms of actually making a diagnosis and then really helping the family to care for Jerry as she progressed through the various stages of the illness. And Howard absolutely insisted on caring for her and he did so so lovingly and so intensely over her years of suffering and decline. I think music was really important to my grandma in the later stages of her life because kind of all of her short-term memory kind of was going away so that was one thing that really stuck with her. We were sitting around the dinner table and she was singing along with the songs that were playing and she was laughing and smiling and she stayed up so far beyond the time she would normally ask to go to bed. It was such a treat to have a little part of her back. Anything that brings them back is just magical. That's all I can say, it was magical. My dad being my number one mentor and best friend, Leonard Lauder has always been probably number two on the list of mentors. When I heard also that both Ronald and Leonard were basically funding all of the back office expenses of a philanthropic effort and that all the money that was being raised was going to help support ways to slow down, prevent, cure this horrible disease called Alzheimer's, I said, you know, how do I get more involved? I kind of, I went pretty big for me, which was fun, as I had a band called The Young Presidents at the time. We put together an event, and one of my proudest moments was being able to have, again, lunch with Leonard and hand him a check for the money that we raised for the evening. Very proud to say that Mitchell has joined our Board of Overseers and will carry on the, uh, the, the flag of the Canna family in, in supporting ADDF. Knowing that we were connected with an organization and people who are at the forefront 
of fighting this terrible disease is invaluable. ADDF looked looked to me like hope. I'm very pleased with with what everyone is doing uh, for the organization and being involved in the organization. I've seen actual progress, real progress. Here's to Howard Caniff and Mitchell Caniff. This is a well-deserved honor. Congratulations to you both. Their dedication and hard work to ADDF is inspiring. I can see a day when we will be able to free other families from going through this excruciating journey. And I am so very proud of the work they do. Howard and Mitchell Cadiff, if it wasn't for your continued support, we wouldn't be able to be here today talking so positively and optimistically about the cure for Alzheimer's. Thank you all. Here's to you, Howard and Mitchell. You make the ADDF and the world at large a much better place. It is greatly deserved, and your work in this area has been truly remarkable. We thank you for your ongoing support to the ADDF Foundation. I'm so very proud to be part of your team. Mitchell and Howard, I'm so honored to be part of this beautiful family. I'm so proud of you both. Mitchell, I love you dearly, and congratulations. Congrats, Dad. Congrats, Grandpa. I'm so happy for both of you, and I'm so happy to be here to celebrate with you. And I really appreciate everything you've done for Grandma Cherry and everyone else struggling with Alzheimer's. You've been enormous help to us, and we're very grateful to, to you both for, um, for working with us over these many years. And we, we look forward, I hope, to many more years of, of working together. I'm incredibly honored, as I know my father is, to accept the Charles Evans Award for 2021. I want to thank ADDF, Leonard and Ronald Lauder for uh, this wonderful award. Uh, but more importantly, thank you for um, recognizing us as we continue to fight as a collective community uh, this horrible uh, disease. What an exciting time for Alzheimer's science and the relevance of the Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation. Now, more than ever, we rely on your generosity to turn today's science into tomorrow's treatments. For those of you who have not donated yet, we hope you will consider scanning the QR code on your screen. And remember, thanks to the generosity of the Lauder family, 100% of your donation goes directly to the science. None of this progress would be possible without the support of our donors, our fantastic co-chairs and former honorees, Chris Johnson, Pamela Newman, Sharon Sager, and David Weinreb. We are especially grateful to our outstanding honorary chairs, Bonnie Pfeiffer Evans and Alice Shore on behalf of their beloved Charles, as well as Nancy Goods and her beloved Mel. Thank you for everything you do. And of course, thank you to Leonard and Ronald Lauder, whose vision and dedication drive us forward every single day. We also want to thank our entire event committee, the Young Professionals Committee, and all of our program participants. Lastly, we want to extend our gratitude to our symposium sponsor, Eli Lilly, and our contributors, especially our breakthrough, discovery, innovation, target, and research sponsors. And finally, thank you to all of you for watching today. Be safe, stay well, and thank you. Thank you.